Ian was a commander for the Royal Navy. Although he wore a naval uniform, he spent the whole of the war stuck in Room 39 of naval intelligence. People like to read about heroes. Espionage is regarded by the majority of the public as a very romantic affair. Ian was not exactly averse to the company of the ladies. Quite a lad, to put it mildly. The first time I met him, he came up to me and said, I hope you're not a lesbian. And I was kissed rather Passionately. And I meant for warm-blooded, heterosexual adults. And I'm not meant for schoolboys. Because I think you're a sexist, misogynist dinosaur. A relic of the Cold War. His first book, Casino Royale, it's almost a confessional, really, of what he is, what he wanted. Sadism, sex, all the secret, unspeakable things he desired. <laughs> it was an autobiography of a dream. James Bond, or 007, is a wildly English top-secret super spy film franchise that has been in business for 57 years. The IP is owned by Eon Productions, E-O-N, short for Everything or Nothing, the name of both a very good video game and the company itself run by the Broccoli family. Why, why did you do that with the uh, music and, and stuff? Our journey starts with Cubby Broccoli, a man with the greatest name of all time, but also the most key creative person involved with the franchise from the beginning. He produced the first eight Bond films and was the key creative behind the scenes, turning this into the business that it is. And he produced a heck of a lot of movies to get there. Hello, fire down below. But there was always more voices than Cubbies, including that of Harry Saltzman. Everyone involved in the story of the James Bond franchise deserves an episode on their own, but we don't have the time. I guess we should do credits. Double O Seven is one of the longest-running same continuity franchises in existence today. Second, really, only to Godzilla, uh, ironically, or is it? I started scribbling, and then suddenly, something happens. It was like having an orgasm. It's a series that has found a way to survive and remain in the conversation for decades. It might not sound like a lot, but think of all the franchises that it has outlasted. There's already a Jason Bourne same continuity reintroduction reboot, the soft reboot as it were, in our rear view, a stone's throw at just three years ago. Bond is still going, and it fought back from the brink for practically its entire existence. I get it. Running a business is already hard enough, and I can only imagine most family businesses add an extra layer of patience to an already extremely difficult thing to succeed at, so I get it. The Broccoli Family! In concert with a lot of crews, actors, directors, set designers, costume designers, makeup artists, stunt people, lighting crew, and a hell of a lot of other people. I'm saying outside of what the text says, so to speak, I see what I did there, James Bond keeps a lot of people employed. James Bond, job creator. Not where I saw this episode going, but okay. The first film in the series, Dr. No, in 1962 was a cultural phenomenon the world over. It returned 60 times its $1 million budget. One Man Against the World is commonly touted as the subgenre that Bond created. Ain't no Die Hard without Bond. Ain't no sunshine, yeah, that whole one man against the world phrase is going to pick up additional meaning as we talk about where Bond came from, what it is as an artistic expression and entertainment apart from being a business. Bond is a pretty troubling thing, and at the center of it all is Ian Fleming. Allow me to set a stage. When Casino Royale was published in 1953, you have a lot of fear and uncertainty in the world. 
James Bond came into existence the same year as the USSR tested their first hydrogen bomb, setting off an arms race with the United States that would last for decades, the Cold War. The Invisible War. Ian Fleming, an actual spy from World War II whose codename, and this is true, was 17F. 17F. Goes off to Jamaica after the war to his house he named Goldeneye and puts together a novel he himself referred to as, and I'm quoting, Dreadful Oafish Opus. Oh, and he stole the name James Bond from an actual person. When I started to write these books, I wanted a really flat, quiet name. And one of my Bibles out here is James Bond's Birds of the West Indies. And so I simply stole it and used it. Very fast, 2,000 words a day, on a golden typewriter. Short sentences. Sentences like, Bond's gun spoke once. Ian's friends told him the book was pornography. The publisher was super sketchy on the whole thing. And the New Statesman said it was, without a doubt, the nastiest thing I have ever read. But don't take my word for it. Here's an excerpt from the novel. And to set the scene, this is James's internal monologue in the book Casino Royale after Vesper is kidnapped and he blames her for getting kidnapped and reveals some deeply troubling things about both our main character and our author. Go! But Ian was a man of infinite contradiction. A drink was never good enough. Women were never satisfying enough. He discovered the Bond motto, which was the world is not enough. Delicious. Ahem. This is just what he had been afraid of, these blithering women who thought they could do a man's work. Why the hell couldn't they stay at home and mind their pots and pans and stick to their frocks and gossip and leave men's work to the men? And now for this to happen to him just when the job had come off so beautifully. For Vesper to fall for an old trick like that and get herself snatched up and probably held to ransom like some bloody heroine in a strip cartoon. The silly bitch. It's gonna be a yikes for me, dog. That's not in any way a one-off, by the way. Just open any one of the books and search for the word, let's say, woman to come up. Yeah, I get it. The 50s were a long time ago and people thought dumb, bad, dumb things. Listen, I grew up with James Bond as just part of the culture around me. He is allowed to treat people badly because he saves the world. No one is unclear on this. You can only point out the behavior with a wink and a nod for so long. Bond's peers look the other way and end up validating his toxic, horrendous, HR pinup behavior and ergo, so does the audience. The first time I met him, he came up to me and said, I hope you're not a lesbian. Connecting author conduct pretty concretely to the text here, 007 is a behemoth of action cinema and is a franchise I love. It has inspired me in so many ways my whole life. Without Bond, there is no Die Hard, there is no Fast and Furious, and there is no The Office's John Krasinski and Amazon's Tom Clancy's Jack Ryan. The Broccoli Family. This is directly connected to the soul of your franchise. Fleming describes men as the only real human beings and women as like dogs. I am saying this from a place of love. I saw Die Another Day on opening day. Right, bros, we're going to do kite surfing. Tsunamis today. <laughs> kite surfing a tsunami. But we did some math. Here's a couple of but did you knows. But did you know? Being romantically linked to James Bond gives you a 31% chance of dying. But let me make that worse for you. But did you know? In 75% of all Bond films, at least one of the female leads is killed. 75%, 18 films. We have a spreadsheet. You did Terry Hatch dirty, and I'm still cross about it. I've been asked to state my feelings about a fellow named Bond. Bond is fearless, skilled, witty, courageous, and one other thing, he always gets his girl. And to think, I had to preface all of that just so I could talk about.
Skyfall is a pretty good James Bond movie, but an exceptional film. What about death and rebirth? It's sort of shocking to listen to Sam Mendes walk through the film on the commentary track to illustrate that in the first scene we meet the older James and we'll spend the entire movie asking, can he still be the world's preeminent super spy? Which you can answer like this, James in hot pursuit comes across a bleeding agent, the next him, so to speak. He is faced with his own mortality bleeding and dying on the chair. The dying dude in the chair represents the next generation, the ones that were supposed to replace old James at MI6 who has a lifetime of scars and guilt. This is a movie about your body failing you when you depend on your body because like you made that 100% of your value to the w world. And James callously leaves his younger mirror in a film that has a thing with mirrors and reflections to die. It's sort of a grand joke. Is James Bond as unstoppable as even he thinks he is? And the answer is no. No he isn't. Time stops for nobody. Well that like ties directly into what you're saying about the legacy and history of the- Skyfall is a 2012 film directed by Sam Mendes with writing credits for Neil Purvis, Robert Wade, and John Logan. And I've already buried the lead here because this is the third time that Sam Mendes and Roger Deakins teamed up in their trilogy of the most beautiful films ever made, Jarhead, Revolutionary Road, and Skyfall, which I assume means I have to do an episode on Revolutionary Road next year. And that's a wonderful segue as I can put into your head to keep in mind as they talk about other things. Look at the way James is photographed in this film. He's tired, weary, depressed, aged, regretful, spiteful, and ultimately accepting of mortality. Also, the movie turns into Home Alone at the end. Jesus Christ! Hey, let's talk about this action movie on a technical level of difficulty. This is the quad Lutz level of difficulty here. Bond movies always have whiz-bang intros. It's a thing. There's a legacy. And Skyfall's intro is bananas. It's a brilliant structural escalation. Foot chase, shootout, car chase, train chase, the sniper must make an impossible shot. It never stays one thing. There's motorcycle driving on rooftops in Istanbul, a thing they really did. Well, I mean, obviously Daniel Craig didn't. Really good. A little bit different. You know, the guys were doing quite high speeds, 45, 50 mile an hour on a sort of three foot wide piece of concrete for most of the chase. The photography in the film lifts this idea by portraying James as an absolute icon in every way. The way this sequence escalates is unreal. Every sequence is just like, <laughs> icon. And then this sequence ends with James essentially dying. Boom, we enter the credits. Something Mendes described as what he sees as Bond's subconscious, which tracks perfectly because it's horny as hell, but it's the stuff in between. Bond is lost and doesn't know who to trust. Also his fetish is Guns N' Roses Tron porn. Death. Rebirth. MI6 is blown up. It is reborn as a quaint subway station hideout. Very TMNT2 vibes. M dies. There is a new M at the end of the movie. We got a new Q in this one, a new Monty Penny. Old things become new things. Rebirth. Where the hell have you been? Enjoying death. Now that he hath died, who is James Bond? And he lives the life of a spring breaker who couldn't let go of that life and lost all meaning in his own life and basically becomes an alcoholic. Who are you if all you are is prowess at a single thing? Or arguably two things. James Bond sinks to the bottom of the well of self-isolated torment. And he asks himself, who am I? And he doesn't have an answer. Watch the news and realize through the fog of who you are, you actually did have responsibility. You also failed it. Who are you? The shower might be in order. I'll go home and change. Oh, we've sold your flat. Put your things into storage. Standard procedure on the death of an unmarried employee with no next of kin. Oh, is all of that existential dread getting to you? You blow off psychological concerns about your state of mental health after experiencing a grievous trauma and then blow off the test and pretend mental health understanding is dumb and meaningless because real boys don't have feelings based on traumatic events! A spell that pumps into your head. For example, I might say day, and you might say wasted. I'm saying it's asking the right questions. But pump the brakes because the same dumb tropes are still there. Bond women literally framed as a mysterious prize to be won. He pursues her parallel to the mission at hand. 
As she is indeed involved in it, he pursues her blindly, oblivious to obvious consequences. He walks into her shower, where I can only presume she wasn't expecting him a thing Sam Mendes speaks about on the commentary, because they exercised a wealth of caution to not make James appear as a quote-unquote sex pest. Yes, that is criticism of the character at hand, but also the people responsible for making the decisions about what happens with 007 behind the scenes. Here's some constructive feedback given as if it were a live Twitch stream. Love your films, Broccoli fam, but the persistent misogyny is getting more difficult to stomach as the years go on and the world grows further beyond their myopic views of women and gender from 1953, which are well documented within the text and the making of the films themselves. Epson chat, y'all! Anyway, back to what Bond movies are good at, erotic subtext. Well, oh, sh uh... Villains. I meant villains. Silva is a great one where Javier Bardem found extreme pleasure in playing Silva as Bond's opposite. He pursues Bond physically in the same way that Bond pursues women. The sort of hilarious Ouroboros of the whole dynamic is that yes, Silver was captured on purpose to enact his plan, but that's the same thing that James Bond does. He gets captured by Silva on purpose so he can use the transmitter to capture him. Thing of it is, Silva is mad because these secret agent super networks who allow no oversight whatsoever refuse to take one ounce of culpability. An argument the film litigates in a courtroom. Now. Looking at Silver's computer, it seems to me he's done a number of slightly unusual things. Anyway, Q plugs Silva's laptop directly into the MI6 network, which doesn't go super hot for him. He's using a polymorphic engine to mutate the code. Whenever I try to gain access, it changes. Silva escapes all of this wild super double, but my real plan was... Super villain stuff is all textbook Bond to me, so it didn't really bother me. But it's what happened next that I love. It's one of my favorite sequences in film history. These two old birds who know every aspect of themselves is washed up, find themselves at an impasse where they both decide to take responsibility for their previous selves. And Mira James, Silva, is new school as they come, cyber warfare, data mining, Bitcoin by the looks of his she shed. The literal old school versus the state of the art. No gadgets, no spectacle. Three ghosts of a previous world fighting an army with whatever they can find in the junk drawer. Fighting for their lives in a shell that once housed James himself. He cannot fight his own history any harder than he is. This is the only Bond backstory in Bond. It peels back the artifice of the entire franchise. No missiles, no laser beams, no shark tanks. Just three people defending an old house from a dude who can bring the world to its knees. Just exceptional work over the course of this sequence that just builds and builds and builds and builds. I watch it all the time. This tiny sequence brilliantly staged in this cramped and wildly under-equipped house is blown up and then the whole thing crescendos in this beautiful visual poem of the apocalypse. Just totally reverses what you thought you were watching. It's small and cramped and then it's explosive and big and outside. It just, it sucks itself inside out. Roger Deakins, you take my breath away. Will you sign my yearbook, please? We deal with some stuff. Bond gets his dude, I guess. And these two people that care about each other share a final moment. M says, at least I did one thing right. Which is a loaded sentence for a figure of personal leadership to say as they die in your arms. And after a long and earned emotional journey, James reevaluates who he is and how he conducts himself. Just kidding! He ain't learned shit! I'm gonna put my dick in a martini, y'all! I'm not sure there are that many films that give me quite the same sensation that Skyfall gives me. To do this huge magic trick, setting up this 50-year-old film character to age out and accept he'd lost a step, and end that movie with a fireworks display of cinematography composed of nothing but showstoppers, and it ends with the death of a character who has taken exactly none of James Bond's sexist horseshit since the moment she stepped on the scene in 1995. Because I think you're a sexist, misogynist dinosaur. A relic of the Cold War. 
Dame Judith Olivia Dench, and you let our queen die in his arms. It felt like this monumental crescendo in service of something, but it was just the opposite. In my house, you watched Roger Moore on weekends when it was on the dang TV. Moonraker is wild, y'all. It is a wild thing. Who can forget old Holly Goodhead? I'm looking for Dr. Goodhead. You just found her. A CIA agent combo astronaut. The classic package. James Bond, my dude. You are truly indiscernible from parody. I wasn't allowed to watch the Timothy Dalton ones. I mean, I was seven when License to Kill came out. Please don't be mad. GoldenEye is still a stone cold classic. Casino Royale made me believe that this gritty reboot in the golden chemical romance age of gritty reboots actually had something to say, but James, it's not you, it's me. I expect too much. I do this and I rally for movies all the time. I love loving movies. It's my love loving his thing. I remember seeing Skyfall in the theater. Ah, oh, to make an entire film about accepting the responsibility of the people you fucked over and taking ownership of your own choices in the face of a certain death. And then at the end be like, nah, JK, y'all. And on top of that, it's still there. The same shit every time. Severine, a victim of human trafficking, is relentlessly pursued by James and he does not save her. She is murdered due to his failure, but if you want to get real with it for a second, she was murdered because M cleared Bond for service after he failed all of his mental and physical tests. Why didn't I Bond pass the tests? He didn't. She cleared a literal license to kill. I should get one thing right. Well, you certainly did a court martial. And the only thing James says after it happens is, <sighs> It's a waste of good scotch. She is never mentioned again? Surely you see the issue that you, James Bond, take pride in being cruel to women. Tattoo on your wrist is Macau's sex trade. You belong to one of the houses. What were you, 12? I know when a woman is afraid and pretending not to be. <laughs> not like him. I can help you. It's a waste of good scotch. So honest question, is that your business strategy? Maybe some of us truly never grow. Perhaps you, James Bond, are destined to stay a psychotic sex pest forever. Maybe that's all you were ever capable of saying and maybe that's exactly where you came from. And you are free to make your own decisions, James. I wish you all the best, but I gotta move on, bro. I think I'm gonna see some other forms of entertainment for a while. I can't stay here like this anymore. I gotta spread my wings and just see what's out there, you know? Maybe Killing Eve, rewatch The Americans, and who can forget about The Office's John Krasinski and Amazon's Tom Clancy's Jack Ryan? This is the end of the road for us, James. And I am given strength in this difficult moment by the incredibly moving words of the modern poet, Adele, <clears throat> this is the end. Hold your breath and count to 10. Feel the earth move and then hear my heart burst again. For this is the end. I've drowned and dreamt this moment so overdue. I owe them. Swept away, I'm stolen. Adele wrote a goddamn breakup song and it was right there the whole time. Ooh, David McIntyre, Wooden Leg, Matt Hessinger, Ken Burns, John, who could forget John or Jerry? Hey, Jerry. Jill Pilar, John Heidman, Black Tooth Bob, saying all the names because David Smith, Jay Wants a Cat, Tobias Hodges, Tobias, I don't. No, I said it like that, I'm sorry. It's really hard to read this fast. And there is a reason I'm doing this. Uh, 
If you'd like to be on this list, go to patreon.com slash movies and Mikey. And if the people on this list in the pretzel tier, the king pretzel tier, of Patreon would like me to slow the credits back down, that'd be great. I'm just testing it out because uh, four or five minutes of credits really messes you up with the algorithm because words. I don't know. Lord Zorg, Aaron Paquette, Blorg, Smorg, Terrible Bland. Trey Warren, Ray Johnson. Follow me on Twitter at MikeyFace with Jacob Kozio. Bye.